coordinator for the city of Federal Way um, for the surface water management position. So you may be wondering um, what stormwater has to do with natural yard care. So rain washes the chemicals and pesticides and fertilizes fertilizers off your, your lawn and your garden. And it goes into nearby storm drains and storm drains lead this untreated water directly into our local water bodies. Um, while I'm gonna talk about this, you can still grow healthy and beautiful plants in your yard and have a great lawn using natural yard techniques. So by choosing natural or organic products, you can reduce harmful chemical exposure to your family, our streams, lakes, Puget Sound, otters, orcas, salmon, salamanders, you get the idea. So this presentation um, by the City of Federal Way is made possible by the help of Amanda Miller, who is the director of the South King Pool Library. And she is also the Zoom master tonight and will be providing technical assistance to you during the presentation. So Amanda, turn it over to you. Thank you, Sheila, what a lovely intro there. Um, hi guys, I am the executive director of the South King Pool Library slash everything. Uh, I, my name is Amanda Miller. Uh, I'm your neighbor. I'm a federal resident and uh, also garden uh, enthusiast as best I can. Um, if you haven't heard of the tool library, I'm so excited to be able to share that with you uh, and bring it to our community. But we lend all types of tools for gardening. Uh, Listen home to this. Improvement this is projects. important to know. <laughs> yes, it is important to know. <laughs> uh, we lend all kinds of tools. So um, everything from, you know, the, the normal things you find for your yard. We have one cultivator and we're hopefully going to get another one, but um, also your home improvement bowls. So drills and saws and things like that. Even uh, food preservation items like dehydrators uh, and other unique tools like the machine. Um, so uh, yeah, we're really excited to partner with the City of Federal Way to get this uh, series going and I will do my best to keep us flowing here. We are gonna record this session uh, for later viewing. If you can't stay, you get dropped off, uh, whatever the case is. Uh, and so keep that in mind. If you choose to unmute uh, during questions and answers, you might wanna keep your camera off to ask those questions, but it's always nice to have your camera on when somebody's speaking to you. So anyway, I will uh, throw it back to Sheila. If you'd like to introduce Mr. Walt to uh, the group here. Great. Yeah, thank you so much, Amanda. So um, just before I introduce Walt, I just want you to know that toward the end of the presentation, you'll see a survey link in the chat. It would be really great if you could fill it out. It's only five questions. And according to SurveyMonkey, it should take you less than two minutes to fill out It's multiple choice. And also um, we have some resources for you, which I'll email to you tomorrow. And that includes coupons for compost made possible by Cedar Grove Compost. Um, and then don't forget to register for our upcoming event. So a little bit about our speaker. Um, our presenter for natural yard care is Walt Birdsall. It, his presentation is about 40 minutes and after that he'll be available for question and answer. So a little bit about him. Um, Walt grew up in northern, northern Wisconsin with the wilderness at his back door. He would spend hours wandering through the forest and canoeing on lakes and rivers in the summer or cross-country skiing and snowshoeing in the winter. And it's where he learned to love nature and came to appreciate clean, clean air and water as well as wildlife habitat. Um, he attended Eastern Washington University and WSU and received a BA degree in wilderness recreation management. And for several, several years, he was the outdoor and environmental education director at YMCA Camp Seymour. And he currently works for the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department where he promotes natural yard care by encouraging gardeners to use fewer chemical fertilizers and pesticides in their yard. And he also educates the public about arsenic and lead in soils in the Tacoma Smelter Club. So I'm gonna pass this over to Walt. Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me and uh, thank you, Sheila. Well, uh, this time of year, I, I don't know about you, but I get really excited because uh, looking outside and seeing all the daffodils coming up and the cherry blossoms and you know, the, the roadies will be the next thing that'll come. So we get real excited about our yards right about this time of year. And what I'm gonna do tonight is I, I also wanna talk about 
uh, ways that things that you can do in your yard to maybe not, as, as Sheila mentioned, maybe not use so many chemicals because they do walk, wash downstream. And she put it very well that they wash down into streams and lakes and even in the Puget Sound and can even filter down into our groundwater where, you know, water that we pump up to drink. So uh, that's why the health department's involved in it. Uh, that's why the city of Federal Way is interested because uh, we just don't want stuff. We only want rain going down the drain, as they say. And uh, unfortunately, when we put chemicals in our yard, that doesn't always happen that it can run off into your yard or into the streams, I should say, I'm sorry. So what I wanna do is just give you a, just a, a little idea of a couple of different things that I do at the health department. And Sheila mentioned was one of the uh, programs that I'm involved in is called Dirt Alert. And I have just a few, uh, just some information about that because it does kind of relate to the overall, uh, well, it relates to soil and definitely soil in federal way and uh, the surrounding areas here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen. Here we go, if you could just bear with me for a second. Do you see it now? Can you see my screen? Okay, am I muted? Yep, there we go. Okay, this is a good, this is a good sign. And then I'm going to, uh, Okay, we're getting there. We're getting there. Okay, there we go. Everybody see that? That that's our Dirt Alert logo. Um, do you see this? Everybody see that on your screen? Please it let me like know. It might be in a presenter's view. Is there a way to change it to a um, a viewer's view? But we, we can see it. Okay. Um, I don't know if I can change that on. Can I change that on my end or? Yeah. That... Yep. I think it's that one. One of. Um, or um, maybe not. No, no. Okay. This is good. We got okay. it. <laughs> okay. So like I mentioned, I, I work in the Dirt Alert program. And what Dirt Alert is about, it's about the old smelter that used to be located right near Point Defiance Park. Uh, it was it was known as the uh, Asarco smelter. And maybe you might be familiar with it. Maybe you're not. If you're new in the area, you may not be familiar that what, uh, what was going on down there. But uh, this is located right where the new Point Ruston development is now, where the, all the high rises are going in and all the restaurants and everything right down there by Point Defiance. There was a smelter there where they smelted copper for almost a hundred years. And in the process of smelting copper, they emitted, uh, it emitted arsenic and lead into the air. Emitted means the smoke that came out of the smokestack uh, had arsenic and lead in it, floated around uh, the area the arsenic and lead landed on the ground and it binds with the topsoil. So it's still there yet today. And uh, we're still uh, concerned about it as far as a health concern. And uh, th that's what why we have that program. And uh, one of our concerns still is uh, kids playing in the dirt, you know, getting on the ground that they could ingest it or inhale the dust from the arsenic. And it could cause, uh, it doesn't cause immediate health problems, but it could cause uh, health problems uh, down the, down throughout their life. Uh, lead is also a concern, and of course, lead causes uh, could cause developmental uh, issues with kids. So uh, this is just something I want to let you know about because Federal Way is only you know as a crow flies about ten miles from the the original site, so there is some contamination in the soils around Federal Way as well. So I just don't let you know that. And if you have more information or in want more information, we can uh, let you know some more about it. This is just a map of the uh, what we call the Tacoma smelter. And the way this is drawn on here is because of the way the prevailing winds took the arsenic and lead. So you can see uh, Federal Way is just out across the water there. And um, uh, it, depending on which way the wind was blowing, you know, it blew it either north or south all the way as far south as DuPont. And this is just to give you an example of maybe how bad it was back in the day. This is a gentleman mowing his lawn with arsenic and lead in, on his grass. And uh, that looks uh, pretty, pretty toxic right there. But luckily the uh, smelter was uh, taken or was closed in 1985 and the uh, smelter stack was taken down in about 1983 or 1993. So the, the source of the contamination isn't around anymore, but um, it's still on the ground. ground. So, this is just if you have any more in, in if you have any more questions about that, you can contact me or you could go to the 
uh, Seattle King County Public Health website and get more information about it too, okay? Another source of uh, lead we find, we find sometimes is along the side of old houses. They use lead in paints up until about the 70s. So sometimes uh, we find high lead levels right along that, what we call that drip line. And that's an area that can get very dusty along your house because it gets very hot there. You know, if the sun's beating down on it. So we just recommend putting some kind of mulch down there or even trying to plant some, uh, maybe some plants along there just to keep that area from uh, collecting or being able to produce dust. So that's just a short, just to give you, I know you came to uh, learn about natural yard care. So uh, I'm gonna do a transition into that now. So here we go. <laughs> so natural yard care, like I said, just uh, look, finding, looking for ways that you can go natural on your yard and, and not having a lot of um, chemicals floating downstream and heading out to Puget Sound. And there's actually five steps that we use and one of the ones is just building healthy soil. If you build healthy soil, your plants will be healthy and uh, they'll be less susceptible to disease and therefore less uh, need of any type of chemical spray or anything like that. Plant the right plant in the site. That's very important. And we'll talk about that a little more. Uh, practice smart watering. Watering's a, a real big issue because if you water too much, some water can actually run off your yard and that could carry some of the contamination. And then think twice before using pesticides. We'd like to say that uh, trying to use pesticides would be the last resort. Okay, so just try to use uh, trying to use pesticides as the last resort, and then uh, practice natural lawn care. Okay, so we'll we'll talk about all these subjects in some detail. All right, so here's just an example or a diagram of healthy soil. And if you notice that um, we think about our soil, the mineral soil is the soil that was here way back from when the glaciers were here. That soil, that mineral soil, that's all the ground up rock and sand and all that stuff that's in the soil already. And then 25% of healthy soil is actually air. You always think, you don't think maybe think of air and soil, but it's very important that soil is able to have enough room and uh, be, able to have air in it so it can also hold water. If, air, if soil is too compacted, then it's not going to hold air and it's definitely not going to hold water. So it's very important that the soil, the soil under your plants is, uh, is it can be fluff, what I call fluffed up or something to, to make it allow to have soil or have air and water. And then only about 5% of soil needs to be uh, organic materials. We always think that, well, healthy soil has lots and lots of organics in it, but maybe not, maybe not so true. Uh, although the uh, organic matter in your soil is kind of like um, the refrigerator for your plants, you know, like if like your plants are a teenager, they want to, they want to eat. So they're going to look for some kind of organic matter. So having healthy soil, and uh, it's traditional that we in our yards, we see leaves on the ground, so we rake them up, we put them in the you know compost, or we send them out on the street, and we continue to do that. But if you're in the think about in the forest, what happens when leaves fall down on the ground? They they rot down and they become the uh, they, they decompose and they become the fertilizer for plants. Well, a lot of times we remove that stuff when in fact plants really need that. So in order to give some of that back to plants it's important to maybe add things like some type of natural fertilizers, either compost or a slow release fertilizer. And uh, compost, of course, is rotted materials and you can make that yourself or you can buy it in bags at the store. You can work it into your plants, work it under your roadies, spread it on your lawn. You can, I'm giving it back, I'm thinking about uh, giving it back to the to the, the uh, soil. And I, I think sometimes we don't really think about soil as much as we should when we're growing our plants. Um, in the summertime, you know, it gets very, very hot and dry here. And it, and, uh, it can be so very hot and dry that, that there's no water down there for plants, but we don't even know that. We sometimes it's good to just take a shovel or something down there and dig down a little bit and just see what the soil's doing. I always like to kind of probe down into the soil so I can tell you know, is it have enough moisture? Does it look like it has organic matter? Does it look healthy? Do you see any worms? 
for instance, if there's nothing like that down there, then uh, your soil might not be as healthy as it could be if you had some type of, um, say, organic matter put in there. The other thing is to plant the right plant for the site. So often uh, we buy a plant, we want to put it in somewhere, but if you, you really, really need to think about, is that plant going to be happy there? And uh, it might take a while for that for you to realize that, wow, that isn't a really great place for that, that plant. And I've done that at my house where I've had a plant that was, I put it out in, the, in too, too much sun and it just was struggling. But yet I, I, if I moved it, I could move it into a shadier area and it would do a lot better. So I think it's very important for us to think about um, what, what uh, plants really want as far as uh, a good place for them to live. This diagram is one that um, shows the uh, this shows the northwest, the kind of the rainfall that we get. You know, we get a lot of our rain in the wintertime, obviously, and in, in the spring, but then it falls off and we have very, very dry summers. Our summers are super dry. And then again, we'll start to get rain in the fall, and of course, the rainfall amounts will go back up. But in the Midwest and back east, of course, in the Winter time, there's not very much uh, precipitation entering the soil, but they get lots and lots of rainfall during the summer. I've been back in Wisconsin where I grew up where it would be raining so hard you'd have to pull off the road. I mean, it was just a torrential rains would come in in the summertime. And if you plant plants that are used to this type of a summer in what we do here in the summer, you're gonna end up watering them a lot or you're gonna need to water them a lot or they won't survive. I think one of the ones that I think of is the Eastern dogwood. Um, if you plant that, that tree and expect it to grow like our native dogwood or some of our other native plants, it just won't work. You've got to keep water on it. So really think about when you plant a plant, where did it come from? Where was it, you know, where is it either the native to or where was the nursery where that plant was, uh, where it was originally planted? And, and that might give you an idea of the best way to uh, put it into place where it might be very uh, good, <laughs> good point. This is a, just a picture of uh, a house and I just wanted to point out the different uh, microclimates around your house. Think about the different heat, the, the areas that are, that are hot. So if this is north, this street right here going north, think about on the west side, how hot it gets there in the, in the late afternoon when the sun beats down on the wall and it creates a real hot area here or to the south right here when the sun comes around and it's just beating down there, that's a very, very hot place. That could be a Northern California climate right there, uh, especially you know in the summertime. So think about the plants that you want to, want to put there. It wouldn't, that wouldn't be a place you would want to plant things like ferns or something like that that are, are very susceptible to heat. Uh, but it's different on the back of the house right here on the north side and even on the east side, there's a lot cooler area here, maybe underneath a fir tree or where there's some shade. Just think about those different microclimates you have on, on your property. Or even this area right here along the side, along the street, uh, it might seem like a place where it's, that wouldn't have too much heat, but yet you're gonna get some heat that comes off of this, you know, the asphalt in the street right there or even off the sidewalk. So those are just microclimates that you might want to be thinking about. <laughs> well, I mentioned planting the plant in the right place. Well, here's an example of one that maybe wasn't planted. I, I actually took this photo when I was riding my bike up on the uh, Burt Gilman Trail in Seattle. And this area had been recently landscaped. And I'm not sure, I think that the landscape company actually planted this tree along the side. This is our, the, um, Washington State tree, which I'm sure you know what it is. It's the Western hemlock. It's the one with the real droopy top. Well, obviously, it's not in the right place because that tree can get, you know, three feet in diameter and it's definitely going to have to be removed. So uh, think about where you're planting. Does your, does your tree have enough room and is it in the right spot? And then also maybe take a look up when you plant a tree, you know, go look to the right, look to the left and look up. This is actually at the health department. Uh, we have some trees that are growing into some lines right there, uh, although these are just uh, information cable lines. So I was told that we didn't have to remove the trees, which I was really happy for because they didn't get up high enough to actually get into the power lines. But it's something to really think about. And you see this quite often when you buy a, buy a plant and you read the description and it says that the tree is going to get 
20 feet high, it's probably going to get 25 feet high. It's probably going to get taller than what's on the uh, on the description of the of the uh, from the nursery. And then this can happen too. Trees come and they're very small, and you just think they're so cute. Hey, let's put it in this small area here, but that doesn't, you know, trees don't stay that way and then eventually they'll grow. So this is a situation where the, whoever the, has these trees, and this is one of our communities here actually that along the street and what, they, what they're doing is they're trying to keep that tree small. And you see this quite often in yards, people like a, a smaller tree, so they cut it back to try to make it small. And I think uh, it's not the best thing to do to a tree. And then also what happens is this uh, sidewalk It'll buckle the sidewalk, and that's another issue when you have a tree in a small place like that. So really think about where you're putting the tree and where you're going to. Uh, is it going to be happy there? I think that's really important for any, any plant that we plant. I really like native plants, so that's why I have this shot in here. Um, these plants, if you're, if you're planting a plant, think about is it in the right place? It Does it have enough room? Is it going to grow large? Is it going to be happy when it's large, are you going to be happy with it too? So you don't have to continue to go in and try to cut it back or or it, it's going to look a lot nicer on your yard if you just let it, you know, let it do do it, let it grow with the way it wants to grow. This one is a uh, red flowering currant. This was one, it's in my front yard and uh, it's uh, a native plant too and it gets a very nice uh, it's starting to bloom actually right now uh, that blooms this time of year. And, but uh, like I say, try, try to find a place where they're happy and you'll have a lot of joy with your plants. The next one, next thing I want to talk about is just smart watering. This is one thing that, uh, that, that that's very important, of course, with your yard. But there are some things to think about. One of the things is to, uh, we recommend that you water one inch per week. And what you can do on your grass, you can set out tuna cans or to, to be, you know, if you set out a bunch of tuna cans and water your grass for a particular amount of time, you can tell how much one inch per week is. So uh, that's what's recommended, just about one inch per week. It doesn't, your lawn doesn't need more than that. Group your plants in hydro zones. In other words, plants that have similar watering needs you could put them in a zone right where you, when you water, like up along the side of the house or whatever, and you'll have uh, be an, an easy place to water and you won't have over, you won't be water, over watering one plant and not giving the other plant enough water. So think about those hydro zones. Use automatic uh, irrigation efficiently. Um, uh, there is all kinds of different automatic irrigation systems out there now. Of course, there's the one you can bury in the ground, but they do have systems now that will just attach to your, to your faucet outside. You can have a regulator on it. You can have a timer on it. You can direct the, uh, the uh, hoses right to your plant and set it so it can water directly to the plant. Um, it's a very efficient way to water your, water your, uh, your property. And then mow grass high. We always say that you should mow grass at about two inches and what that does is it, it allows the moisture to stay in your, into your yard better. And it also can shade out some of the other weeds and things in your yard. So mow grass high, about two inches. And uh, I mentioned direct water system. That was the thing I mentioned about the automatic system. And let your yard go dormant. Um, in about August and September, Grass really wants to go dormant to try to keep it green. It takes a lot of water to do that. And it's okay to let it go dormant. It's not gonna die. In fact, what happens is it goes dormant. It looks a little brown, but when the fall, fall rains come, it comes right back green again. And I think it, I get the feeling that our summers are getting longer and longer and it's harder and harder to keep a lawn watered and looking green. So I think it's uh, okay to let it go dormant a little bit and start cutting back on the water say in August and into September before the, before the rains come. All right, so this is a little test for any gardener or anybody that works out on the yard. This is just a drawing of Mount Rainier. And on top of Mount Rainier, sometimes it gets this cloud. It's kind of shaped like a lens and it's called a lenticular cloud. 
And it's a cloud that'll actually sit on the mountain all day. I imagine many of you have seen it. And what it means is that it's gonna rain within 24 hours. So if you were thinking about watering your garden, you might say, well, you know what? I'm gonna let, it, let the rain come. And of course, now we can look on our phone and we can look on news and we can get the forecast. But I think it's kind of fun to be able to look out in our, you know, on the look out on our land and, and see things like this. So if you ever see a cloud like this on Mount Rainier, you know it's going to rain. And I, I can say uh, I'm a hiker and I used to climb, climb mountains. If I saw a cloud like this on the mountain, I'd be like, oh no, we're going to get rained on. And sure enough, we always would. Hey, Walt. Yeah. Is it a seasonal phenomenon or do you see that year round? No, that's a year round phenomenon. It really it is. Is. Yeah. yeah. Just and sometimes there's pictures of it where it actually looks like some people at one time thought it was flying saucers because it can sometimes go off in one and then a couple of them behind it. It's just kind of strange. It's a strange phenomenon, but it's uh it is a real sign that it's gonna it's gonna rain for sure. Like I said, that warm air coming in off the coast is hitting that cold air at the mountain and it's rising up over the top of it like that. So Okay, and then like I said, efficient watering, I don't know what happened to this place, but definitely an overwater here. We don't need to really go at it so much. And you can see where it's actually, you know, running off onto the street. And it's quite common to see where uh, water sprinklers are set, where they're actually trying to make the, you know, sidewalk grow or the street grow, you know, and it doesn't really need to be that much. You might consider some uh, rain barrels. Rain barrels are great, and uh, I have I have a rain barrel, and I really like it. The only maybe the da downside of a rain barrel when it gets really dry in the summer, of course, there's no rain in your rain barrel, but you can uh, you know wait for a rain. It doesn't take very much rain on your roof to fill the barrel, so uh, it's a it's a it's a fun thing to have, and it's uh, a good way to save some water because and and that water is a really really good water for your plants. That rain water. This is just a picture of a sedum garden. Sedums are very good with, uh, they're, they're a plant that can take a lot of heat. So this could be a garden that you could have along that west side or the south side of your house. Um, sedums are awesome because they can take our wet, wet winter, but they also can take the very, very dry, dry summers that we have and not have to take a lot of water. So this, then they're a lot of fun and there's a lot of different kinds of sedums. So, if you don't know about sedums, check them out. They're, they're really fun to have. And you can grow them, of course, inside as well. There's an inside, in, indoor sedums and there's outdoor sedums. The ones that have the thicker leaves are the ones that can survive outside a little better than the ones that, uh, what we call an indoor sedum. All right. And then think twice about using pesticides. Um, it's uh, one of the things that we try to encourage people to do is like, pesticides, let's make that the last resort rather than just the first thing we do when we see something that we want to change in our yard. We encourage people not to use a weed and feed, weed and feed fertilizers on lawns. Weed and feed fertilizer, what that means is it's the, the uh, fertilizer has the herbicide in it. The herbicide spread throughout the whole yard. It may not even come in ever come in contact with a weed. And therefore, it you know it's a, it's kind of a wasteful thing. If you have weeds, you could you could directly uh, spot treat them. That's what we kind of recommend you do. This is kind of technical, but it's called integrated pest management. And what integrated pest management is? Hey, let's think of all the different things we can do before we actually grab the chemicals to uh, solve our problems. So cultural controls, that's a plant, again, planting the right plant, keeping it healthy. There's something about plants that when they start to stress, and this is proven, and if you're thinking about plants in the forest or wherever, when plants start to stress, insects know it. They, they uh, can tell that the plant is losing its defensive mechanisms and it'll attack the plant. So. Um, if it's stressed out, there are more chances of having some uh, insects and different uh, pathogens get onto your plants. So just be, be thinking about that. Uh, biological controls, that's, that's uh, insects. You know, then if you, uh, you can buy things like um, ladybugs 
to use as predators for things like aphids and stuff like that. Um, they don't work so great, but I think it's good for us to think about that when we spray for a certain particular insect, we might be actually killing the beneficial insects too. I read a study about uh, an infestation of aphids and the, uh, they, they sprayed for the aphid and it killed the aphid. But in the process, it also killed the ladybugs that were the uh, predators. But what sprung back, what came back faster? The aphids came back faster. Okay, so that it's actually made the problem worse because it had also killed off the, uh, their predators. So it's something to really think about and to go out and just spray. I think it's really important that we know what we're doing. If you look on the back of the of a uh, pest or, a, or or some type of a herbicide or whatever, there's lots and lots of information on there, and it's so there's so many things that there's so much uh, fine print on the the bag that it's really hard to tell. You know, is it is it uh, how to use it and how to use it right? And then mechanical controls that is just picking picking things off, looking at your plants. I became a master gardener a few years back, and that really changed the way I look at plants now. I always like to get up really close to my plants, go out, go to your plant and turn over the leaves. Take a real close look at your plants, because I remember uh, one time I was uh, coming home and I noticed that my sweet peas looked really weird all of a sudden. And I went up to look at them, and sure enough, they were covered with, with uh, aphids. So what I did, rather than spray them, I just got the hose and I put it on, you know, a strong hose and I gave it a shot. I just gave the sweet peas a shot. Just the next day, all the aphids were gone. I did that a couple times and I was able to get rid of the aphids. So if you just watch your plants real close and figure out ways that you can pick off the critters and sometimes even. Um, Master gardeners will recommend going out at night with a flashlight, especially if you've got slugs. Take a look and see, because that's when the slugs like to come out. So you can pick them off, or of course, slugs, you can put out the uh, the beer. You can put out a cup of beer. I don't know if you've you heard that one before, but slugs are attracted to that and that, that will get them. But uh, I really encourage you to use mechanical controls. And that's also the same with weeds. Um, I have a dandelion puller and this time of year I go out and watch for dandelions and I, what I do is one of those things I can stick in the ground and pull the dandelion out rather than spray them. Uh, I keep an eye on that. This is also a time to go out and look for shotweed. If you're familiar with shotweed, but it's a little weed that has a little white flower and what it does when it goes to seed, it's just waiting for you to walk by it. And then the seeds just shoot out into the air and they end up on the ground and spread that way. So right now is a really good time to look for shotweed because it's just right now, it's a little white flower weed. You can pull them out really easily and get them, get them controlled. So this is the time of year really to go out and hunt for those smaller weeds and it's gonna keep you from uh, having issues later on. And then the last thing of course is chemical control. And that would be again, spot, going to the spot. One of the things that a lot of people don't like in their yard is clover. And um, you cannot dig out clover. I've tried it. I've actually thought, well, maybe what I could do is I, I took a section of clover in my yard and I thought, I'm just going to dig it out. Well, clover is a kind of plant that if you pull it out. Where's your ruby? Where's the ruby? If you pull it out, it'll actually send out shoots. So it, it really, you cannot do it. So what, if you use a broadleaf uh, herbicide on that, get it right this time of year, just as they come up, spray it a little bit. I even, I even put a little uh, yellow flag by it, just a little mark by it so I can come back and see how it's doing so I can get it out right away. Otherwise, it's going to spread and then you're going to have to use more chemicals if you want to get rid of it. The other side of this is, is hey, uh, Maybe, maybe having uh, clover in your yard isn't such a bad thing. Bees love clover. Uh, bees are, you know, we, we, want, to, we want to uh, provide things for bees. So if you don't mind having clover, clover is a good thing for bees. And clover, from what I understand, was actually introduced years and years ago as a lawn, uh, you know, to put in your lawns. And now it's here as a weed. So it's just the way 
you know, people look at uh, at certain things. I, I don't mind them so much, but I do try to control them. My wife doesn't like them. That's what I said. <laughs> she doesn't like them. Okay, so this is just to give you an idea of some way that you can control weeds. This is my front yard. I know it looks pretty bad. It got pretty bad and I let it go for quite a while. And I thought, oh boy, I better get up there and do something. So, okay. So if you um, think about this, you could say, well, you know what? I could spend a couple hours on Saturday pulling out all those weeds. That wouldn't be very much fun, right? Oh, wait a minute. I could go down to the big box store and I could get a bottle of, or, can, or the, a jug of that stuff. I can't remember the name of it, but it, you can spray it all over and it'll kill everything, one of those kind of things, right? Um, but I don't want to do that because it's not very good for the environment. And I know that, that some of that stuff is going to wash down into the street, right? Or the other alternative you could do is what's called sheet mulching. So what I did is I took the weed whacker and I cut it down as close to the ground as I could. And then I took newspaper and I laid it down on top of it. You can use cardboard. That works really well too. It's anything that, that can rot down. It's gotta be able to, you can't use plastic or anything like that. It's gotta be something that's gonna degrade and become part of the soil, okay? And then the next thing I did is I took a bark. This is uh, what they call arborist chips. And I laid that down on there. And this area actually could be ready now to put flowers in. And, it, and this only took me maybe a half hour to 45 minutes to do. So be thinking about that. How can I control weeds without, um, without using a lot of chemicals? Because if I would have tried to use that, use chemicals on that, it would have taken a lot of chemical to do it. And it would have taken me a lot of time to dig it out, which nobody really wants to dig weeds. So uh, this will work. It, it really does. And then the next year, there'll be some weeds that will come back up, there, but they're easier to pull because they're, it, you know, they're in the bark. They're pretty easy to pull. And you can just keep an eye on it. And this is a good thing to use in the, if you have a fairly good size area of weeds that you want to control. Okay, so the next thing I want to just talk about is just practicing natural lawn care, just how to um, how to do a lawn without using a lot of chemicals. Okay, so lawns are very nutrient and water hungry. If you go into the big box stores, what I call a big box store, you know, the big hardware store, there's pallets and pallets of fertilizer heading for lawns, and the reason for that is is because there, when we plant plants normally, in, let's say you're planting plants in your garden, you would never plant your peas right next to each other, right? Because we know that they're going to compete for the nutrients that are there in the water. But yet in a lawn, a lawn's not a lawn unless it has plants that are planted right next to each other and will compete. So that's what your lawn's doing. It's competing for nutrients, it's competing for water, and that's why you have to put on more water and more nutrients to keep a lawn going. Otherwise it will not work. Also, it what happens is people like a lawn, but they want the lawn to look the same wherever it is on your yard. Remember at the start of the talk, I talked about different microclimates. So if you have an area that where grass grows really well, say in your front yard, it's probably not gonna grow as well in your backyard where it's shady and it doesn't have as much, doesn't get as much sun. So that's that's something that uh, is, a, is a struggle. How about underneath fir trees? Firs give off uh, the needles. Needles produce a lot, they've changed the, the soil to be acidic. Acidic soil attracts moss. Moss likes shade. So this is an area where you'll struggle to keep grass you know, growing there. So this is an area they might want to consider not growing grass there. Maybe it would be better to put something else in there, ferns and maybe some, uh, you know, some kind of ground cover there rather than try to grow grass in an area like that. How about on the side of a hill? This is, we see this quite often too. If you're going down along the street, you know, you'll see where a lawn comes out from the house and then it drops right down to the street. That's a very, very hard place to grow grass. It's hard to keep water on it. It's hard for, uh, it, it gets very, very hot because of its angle to the sun. 
it's a very, very hard place to grow grass. And that, that again, might be a place where you would want to put uh, some type of shrubs or something in there to, that you don't have to try to get grass to grow there because it's that's a hard spot. This is just uh, an, an example of a natural way that you can go. This is uh, Tagro. And Tagro is the biosolids that are from the uh, Tacoma Tide Flats, the city of Tacoma. Uh, has them and, and that is uh you know it's honestly from human waste so uh city of our or i think king county has an equivalent is that right sheila did you yeah it's called loop is there a... it's uh it's called loop or growth loop. Co. yeah i'll send a link out to okay. everybody yeah yeah uh, this stuff works really well I what i do is i get some of this and then i just spread it on the yard about a I mow it pretty low, spread it on the yard about a quarter of an inch. And then within a couple weeks, it looked like this. Okay, so it really does come in nice. You'll notice that I have a little bit of clover in there. And I'm, I'm like I say, I, I have mixed feelings about clover. So I, I don't really mind it that much. But anyway, uh, it really does come in nice and green. And the thing of it is with slow release fertilizer, it is slow, it's slower. It takes a little bit longer than a chemical fertilizer. I was in the uh, store the other day, just looking at different fertilizers and one of the bags said green in 72 hours. Well, that's a chemical fertilizer. A chemical fertilizer will green your lawn in 72 hours. And I think what happens is I think we as a culture, we want instant gratification. So we want it to be quick. Slow release, what happens is the microorganisms in your soil are breaking down that fertilizer. And when they break down the fertilizer, they're basically eating the fertilizer and their waste is created, uh, will allow the plants to um, get their nutrients. So it takes a little longer, but it produces the same effect that you have with chemical fertilizers, it just might take a little bit longer. And I'm not talking a lot longer, but it does take a little bit longer for you, for you to see the results. But the results can be can be very nice, and uh, you're doing a good thing for for the environment too. Or I just put this slide in there. I think it's uh, this is a this is a yard in in University Place, and it's just moss, just a moss yard. <laughs> I see some clapping going on. There. Moss is beautiful, and this yard was just amazing when you walk on it. It felt like a carpet. And I asked the gentleman that owned the home, I said, what did you do? And he said, nothing. I did nothing. <laughs> in other words, he let it just come in naturally. And he has a good situation because you notice he has some good shade there. So the, the moss came in. And I guess my emphasis here is that if you can uh, accept some shade, accept some weeds, why not? We don't have to have lawns that look like an extension of our living room carpet doesn't have to be that way. I think uh, if we ha allow some weeds to come in, like I said, the, the bees, we need bees and bees like the flowers. And uh, I, I would like to see someday where we maybe work our way away from lawns and make them more like a mountain meadow or something like that. You know, I mentioned that I like hiking, so I, <laughs> I like to see, see a meadow. And maybe that's something that we can, we can try for. Or you could try this too, what this is, this is one of, this is my neighbor, one of my neighbors, and they have a artificial lawn. This is artificial grass. But you notice there's no free lunch because they get weeds in their artificial turf. And I feel bad for them when they have to go out and, and weed it too. So it isn't night, it's not like you can't, uh, you know, you can just because the uh Artificial turf is permeable and the seeds get down in there. And of course they're gonna, they're gonna grow too. So that's just uh, something to, to think about too. All right, so these are just some ideas for you to be thinking about ways that you could possibly go natural on your yard. And I'm, I'm hoping that um, I was able to give you some ideas or some thoughts. If you have any questions for me, please uh, put them in the chat. And also um, uh, we're gonna give you some resources. and. I think it was right here is where uh, Sheila wanted to remind you of the, <laughs> yeah, she wants to remind you of the five questions at the end, if you please do that. That, 
I know uh, working for the health department, we're always looking for feedback and we're always, we really do use this information. So if we could get your feedback, it's always great. So thank you very much for that. And here are some resources. One of the resources that I think is good, and you can go online and find this, it's called Grow Smart, Grow Safe. And what it is, it, it, it will give you some uh, examples of pests and diseases, but it'll also give you ways to uh, deal with them in a more natural way and uh, a safer way for the environment. Okay, it's called Grow Smart, Grow Safe. Also, uh, the uh, WSU Pierce County Master Gardener Program, there's a demonstration garden in Puyallup. The Master Gardeners have a website, and of course, King County has a chapter. There's 300 volunteers in Pierce County, and I'm sure there's many more in King. So you might want to just ask them. They are so knowledgeable, and they love to share their knowledge with you. So please, please use the Master Gardeners. And you may consider becoming a master gardener yourself. I became a master gardener in 2014 and I never saw myself as a, wow, I'm gonna be a master gardener. It almost scared me in a way that uh, I was gonna be a master at this, but I love native plants and, and um, that's kind of where my interest is um, and, and going natural of course and natural yard care, but they have all kinds of folks that are uh, experts in gardens, in, in vegetable growing, apples, fruits, um, flowers, everything you'd ever want to grow, they know. So please uh, use them. And also they have clinics where you can cut off a branch. So you have a plant that's having a funny fungus or something going on the leaves. You can cut off the branch and bring that to them or take a photo of it. And now with COVID, they're, they're take, you're taking, sending in a photo, but you could, or when they reopen the um, the clinics again, you can take it in and they'll actually analyze it and they'll take a look and they'll get, oh, yeah, you could do this or that to, to, for this plant. And then if they can't answer it, they'll send it to the plant pathologist at the WSU extension. So you'll get your, uh, you'll get your information. They're very good about it. And like I said, very, very, and the demonstration garden is cool too, because it's open to the public. Check their hours though but you can go see different examples of direct watering systems, vegetable gardens, flower gardens, shade gardens, lots of stuff. I'm, I'm very excited about being part of that. And then this is a, a, a good uh, website with the WSU uh, extension too. It's called HortSense, as in horticulture sense. And if you have uh, a plant that's having some kind of disease or whatever, They'll give you some examples and then you can, uh, they'll tell you how to uh, take care of those problems. So it's a very good, it's a very good resource too. And here's my uh, contact information. Um, you'd be more than happy to uh, give me a call or email me. And if I can't answer the question, I'll find somebody that, that can for you. Um, I'd also like to, to encourage you just to look at the, um, uh, Washington Native Plant Society. That's another good website. There's so, so much information out there about plants and also about uh, going natural. We have some webinars coming up uh, in April with through the health department and through our natural yard care program uh, with Mary Ann Benetti, who is a uh, local expert in mainly growing flowers and any kind of plant you can, it, beautiful plants, <laughs> that type of thing. She's giving a webinar on the 20th of April in the evening. And then we have uh, Liesl Zappler, who is doing another one the following week. I'm going to have, um, uh, Sheila's going to send you a flyer on this, so you don't have to write it down or anything. She'll send you a flyer. But, sh but uh, she's going to, uh, Liesl's doing one on weed control. And what you can do, she, she is a super expert on designing your yard around controlling weeds. And she's great. And then the following week, we have Lad Smith, who is going to talk about a natural way to grow lawns, go far beyond what I talked about here tonight. He'll give you all you need to know about how to make your lawn look super great without using pesticides to do it. So Sheila's going to send that out to you. And uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, that's so all I have. I don't know if anybody has any questions in the chat. I'd be more than happy to answer them or is there anything that I can answer for you? 
12, or people can just unmute and try and, you know, speak up. Yeah, speak Either up. Way. Uh, I'll, I'll pause the recording and then that way anyone can join sure. us. But thank you all. Thank you.